afternoon or good morning or good evening. We're delighted to have such a great audience joining us today from such a wide uh, areas from around the world. Welcome to the spring meeting of the National Academies Committee on Earth Resources. My name is Jim Slutes. I'm the chair of the committee. I'd like to just say a few words to uh, about our exciting program today, cover a few housekeeping items, introduce our committee. Before I turn things over to John Marsden, a member of our committee who will be serving as moderator for today's webinar. First, let me just, uh, just for anybody that's new to the committee, let me just share that the Committee on Earth Resources uh, was established in 1991, so this is our 30th year. It is the standing committee of the Board on Earth Sciences and Resources and serves the community by monitoring and engaging on issues relevant to energy and non-fuel mineral resources. The committee examines issues related to the availability, supply, delivery, and impacts of energy and mineral resources, the health and safety of the workforce engaged in resource exploration and production, and the management and stewardship of the lands on which they are located. The committee serves stakeholders with objective, evidence-based scientific and, and engineering information to help support decision and policy making. Our committee has been working on the issues related to minerals, critical minerals, and energy resources for many years. As we began discussing our virtual spring meeting plans earlier this year, we thought it was timely to draw these themes together. The need for mineral resources to support the energy transition as we look toward ways to address climate change. As John will describe to you, we're organized, we've organized the meeting into a three-part webinar series with today's kickoff webinar helping to put into perspective different uh, aspects of minerals, critical minerals, and the global and domestic supply chains related to energy infrastructure. We hope you're able to join each of the other webinars as well on May 17th and June 1st, because we've arranged them to build upon one another and will and will all benefit from, from audience participation throughout. Now, let me say just a few words on how you can share your questions and ideas today. For our committee, you'll be able to raise your virtual hands on the Zoom and John will call on you when, when we move into the Q&A part of the meeting. For those of you in the main audience of the webinar, you may share your questions or comments by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. You can simply type your questions into that box at any time and the staff team will keep track of the questions and share them back to John as he moderates. Uh, and and he'll keep the conversation moving with panelists on the committee. Please participate. Uh, these sessions are uh, the, they're they're intended to be interactive, and uh, we count you as part of the part of the discussion and equation in this meeting. And we'll, in addition, we will be posting the webinar recording on the committee's website, and we'll let you know when that's available, probably in about a week or so after this meeting. With that, let me introduce our committee members, or I'll let me, let me uh, Claire, let, let, them, let me have them introduce themselves briefly uh, with their name and affiliation, and we'll ask them to turn on their cameras and unmute as I call upon them. So uh, we'll just run down the list quickly. Uh, Bridget? Hi everyone, I'm Bridget Ayling. I'm an associate professor in the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology at the University of Nevada, Reno, and also director of the Great Basin Center for Geothermal Energy. Uh, my area of interest and in research is understanding geothermal systems. Um, how do we explore for them more effectively and develop them in a sustainable fashion? Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Bridget. Dan? Hello everyone, I'm Dan Connell, uh, Senior Vice President of Strategy with Consol Energy out of the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. Uh, we are primarily a coal producer, but a big part of my role is working on new technology development in mining, energy, carbon products, and other earth resources. Thanks, Dan. Uh, uh, Doug? Thanks, Jim, and I'm not gonna turn my camera on since I'm in a car for the next five minutes. 
Um, uh, I'm, I'm a, a consultant with uh, uh, Melroy Hollett um, a Technology Partners. I'm a geologist by background with experience in uh, mineral resources, geothermal energy, and uh, long, uh, long career in the uh, oil and gas sector. So experience also both in the, in the federal government and in the private sector. Thanks, Thanks Doug. John Leftwich. John, I think you're muted. Okay, l let me go on and then we'll come back around to John. Uh, Deborah? Thanks, Jim. I'm Deborah Peacock. I'm a metallurgical engineer and a patent attorney. And I'm on uh, two public company boards, one a copper mining company and another a graphite uh, processing company, both of which are important critical minerals for the energy transition. And my background today is 0.99% uh, pure graphite. So I thought that would be fun for this seminar. And uh, I'm also on the, uh, the chair of the regions at New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology. Super. Thank thanks, Deborah. Ann? Thanks, Jim. I'm Ann Robertson Tate. I've worked at Geothermex, a geothermal consultancy, for almost 36 years. Uh, started out in the geothermal industry, and here I am. Um, I'm a geologist by training. Um, very interested in, in developing conceptual models of geothermal systems from multidisciplinary data, and uh, also uh, very involved in women in geothermal. Thanks. Thanks, Ann. Tamika? Hello, I am Tamika Searcy. I am a petroleum system analyst for BP, which is uh, based in the UK. I live in Houston, Texas, where I assist with petroleum of exploration and production uh, via geochemistry and basin modeling. Thanks, Tamika. David. Well, I'm David Spears. I'm the state geologist of Virginia based in Charlottesville, Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, and as state geologist, I'm largely an administrator, but I have a science background. I'm a petroleum geologist. Early in my career, I worked in the petroleum industry. And um, now I'm involved in a little bit of everything, geologic mapping, mineral resources, and geologic hazards. Thanks, David. Uh, John Leftwich, let me come back around to you if we can't see if we can, if you're able to connect. Okay, let me, I'll, I'll take a stab and I'm, um, uh, oh, are you there, John? Okay, John, go ahead. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, my name is John Leftwich. Uh, spent most of my career as a petroleum geologist, for Exxon, Shell, and other companies in the Gulf Coast. And uh, I have uh, spent time teaching structure and tectonics in uh, in uh, Old Dominion University. So I'm pretty much interested in all aspects of geologic uh, sciences. So here I am. Basically, I'm pretty much retired now, uh, but I'm interested very much in uh, all the new things we're about to do here in the coming years. Thank you, John. So... Um... Let me, I'm, I'm, I have one more committee member to introduce, but before I do, I would be remiss. I just wanted just a quick thank you to the National Academy staff, Elizabeth Ada and, and Calla Rosenfeld and, and Eric Edkin and, and all those others that are helping that we couldn't make this work without. Now let me turn and um, uh, the program, let me introduce John Marsden, also our, one of our committee members. John is gonna be our moderator today. Uh, John Marsden has been the president of Metallurgium since 2009. Uh, John has had a, a long career in the mining industry and uh, with, a, with a, a significant stint at Freeport Macraman where he, where he finished out as president of the company. And so, um, and, and uh, uh, John has had a variety of different positions in the, uh, in the mining uh, industry manager as vice president of technology and development or uh, a manager of operations and he is very notably he is uh, a member of the national academy of engineering 
So uh, I'm very pleased that John's going to take over and we have somebody with great expertise uh, shepherding the program today. So John, I'm going to turn the question over or the program over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jim, for that kind of introduction. And uh, welcome everybody to the webinar. Um, I'm going to run you through a little bit of background before we uh, before we get to our speakers. And next slide, please. So the objectives of the the, the webinar series uh, is to to look at mineral availability across global global markets, and we want to discuss what needs to be done now and in the future to facilitate access to the avail and availability of minerals. So we've got a, a forum. This is intended to be a neutral forum for an exchange of ideas and information uh, across a, a broad range of sectors. And of course, uh, to look at potential areas for further examination. Next slide. So this webinar today is, is intended to be an introductory uh, series and looking at uh, what are critical minerals and the practical needs for minerals in energy systems and infrastructure. And it's not a, a US centric view, we're, we're looking at a, at a global view here. Next slide. So we've got three speakers this morning. Uh, and I'll be introducing them immediately before they, they speak. Uh, we've got each of them giving a presentation for about uh, 12 to 14 minutes. And then we're going to have a panel discussion for the second hour of the webinar. Next slide. We've got two more webinars planned, one on May 17th, where we'd be looking at the US mineral endowment and sourcing alternatives and new approaches and technologies for extraction. And we've got four excellent speakers lined up for the second webinar session. And then the third uh, webinar would be uh, on June the 1st. And this would be looking at the regulatory, legal, environmental, economic and policy challenges and opportunities uh, related to the supply chain. And particularly looking at barriers to bringing critical minerals to market. The speakers there will, will be finalized at a, at a later date. Next slide. So this brings us to, to why now? And um, the National Academies have, have previously published uh, an excellent document, uh, but it's now 13 years ago on minerals, critical minerals in the US economy. And in many ways, that was a very forward look and prophetic document. Since that time, we've seen an increasing number of, of very significant publications on the role of minerals and metals for a low carbon future. And uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but you can see that, that in the last few years, uh, there's been a massive amount of interest developed. Next slide, please. And of course, in the last, just the last month and a half, two months, we've seen some, some pretty significant moves uh, and, and discussion, uh, both in the news and, and in uh, other forums about the importance of metals and minerals uh, as, we, as we move into an energy transition. And most recently, of course, last week uh, was the announcement with the target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the US uh, by at least 50% uh, by 2030, which uh, is, is a, a major uh, target here. Next slide. Before I turn over to the first speaker, maybe just give a little bit of context here and, and discuss a little bit um, what, what are critical elements. And, and this is a particular classification um, developed by the American Physical Society recently. And this, this shows their view of critical elements uh, broken down into, into convenient groupings, but the colored elements have been identified as critical elements. The point here that critical elements are, are different in different jurisdictions. 
transactions into different entities. And um, they can be viewed uh, very differently depending on your, on your particular perspective. And uh, the next slide shows a, a different view, which is the American Chemical Society, uh, their view, and they've, they've classified elements as limited availability or rising threat from use, and then a serious threat within the next 100 years. The, 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 point, the point here is that there's a, a significant number of elements that are viewed as critical by different jurisdictions, and there's a huge amount of overlap uh, amongst these elements. Next slide. And finally, just uh, this is a, a excerpt from the USGS um, looking at requirements of elements in integrated circuit chips in computer chips. And, and the reason this is important, in the 1980s, there were just 12 elements required. In the 1990s, it increased to 16. And, and in, the, you know, in the 2000s, we're up now around 57. So 45 elements more than were required in the 1980s. And this in many ways reflects this, uh, this energy transition. And so with that, um, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, which, and it's Karen Hanghoy, the director of the British Geological Survey. She's got uh, degrees from the University of Copenhagen, including a PhD, her honorary doctorate from Uppsala, and uh, her prior roles uh, listed down here, but she's uh, done a, a large amount of research uh, at, at various institutions, both within Denmark and also at Woods Hole, Columbia, and has been a consultant to the mineral expl exploration industry. So with that, I'll introduce Karen. Thank you very much, John. Um, it's a great honor to be here. It's great to, uh, to get the... Uh, the honor of being the first speaker on this excellent uh, series of webinars. I think that it will be incredibly interesting and I really like the way it's structured with sort of starting with, uh, with really with the rock and then we are ending up and talking a little bit about how society is going to have to respond um, to some of these really important issues. I'm gonna share my screen. There, I hope everyone sees that. And so basically, I, uh, being the first speaker, I get sort of the privilege a little bit of, uh, of waving my arms around and, and talking about uh, the big picture of things. And so my, my semi-lame title reflects that a little bit, Minerals and Metals in the Energy Transition, Criticality, Demand and Supply, and circular economy. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to cover any of those in great depth, but I'm just going to introduce a little bit some of those concepts that, uh, that we need to, to talk about when we talk about how earth resources are going to enter into the energy transition going forward. And so uh, John introduced this as well. This, uh, this work, this book from, uh, from 2008 by the National Academy of Science, was really, I think, a milestone in the way that we think about this and the way we, we discuss it, and also in the way that the um, that earth sciences are sort of engaging with this whole uh, discussion. But basically, there were uh, six objectives to this study when it was uh, commissioned back uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago. And it was identify critical minerals and mineral products, <coughs> excuse me, uh, assess the trends in sources and production status of these minerals, examine the potential constraints. I mean, what's actually sort of playing into this? Uh, uh, is it geology? Is it economy? What is it? Identify impact and disruptions in the supply, describe and evaluate the current level of information uh, for decision-making, and identify types of information that may be needed to better understand that. And this was the, the figure that was really used to do pretty much all of those things uh, in that study. It's a very simple uh, idea and concept, but it really has tremendous sort of power in, in dealing with this problem. Basically what you see on the, on the left is the, is the principle that on the y-axis you have the impact of uh, supply restriction. How important is it? How bad is it if you can't have it? And on the x-axis you have the supply risk. What is the chance actually that there is going to be a, a limit to supply? 
<coughs> and on the right hand side, you see basically the result of a very careful analysis of this, trying to quantify those two ways of looking at different minerals. And you can see here on the right, the 11 elements that were studied in, uh, in this uh, particular study, including some mineral groups such as the rare earth elements. And as you can see here, for example, not very surprisingly, something like copper, tremendously uh, important. So if we couldn't get enough of it, it would be a huge uh, problem. But the supply risk is actually not that great because it's something that's being produced um, in, in, in many different places. So basically, this mapped out the study, the different, um, the different elements and how we could think about criticality. And these are some of the conclusions that came out of this study. And the ones that I perhaps think are sort of most important for discussion here today, and maybe especially the two first ones, all minerals and all mineral products could become critical. This is really important. And also a critical mineral is both essential in use and subject to the risk of supply restriction that was shown in the figure before. And criticality may change as technologies evolve and new products develop. And that is also really, really important because what that actually tells us is that why we need to talk about criticality and find solutions to criticality, we really should talk about minerals in general because we don't know what's going to be critical tomorrow. And as John just showed now, there's also different criticalities for different sectors. So criticality is a hugely elastic and relative kind of term. And so it's important that we're very precise about what we want out of it. Very importantly, the restrictions on supply, so that uh, that uh, x-axis in the, in the diagram is typically due to significant increase in demand, thin markets, production concentration. So is it all produced in one country, for example? Production as byproduct or lack of stock for recycling and or infrastructure required for the recycling. Also in the conclusions that over the longer term, these were sort of the restrictions of supply in the, in the short to medium term, in the longer term, Availability is really largely a function of investment, like pretty much everything else in this world, including, of course, the investment in understanding this, so the, in, so the education and the research that goes into it. Decision makers need continuous, unbiased and thorough information, and more information needs to be collected, and more research needs to be conducted on the full mineral cycle. So not just where can we find these metals and minerals, but actually how do they move through society? How do we understand the full cycle? So that was sort of a summary of criticality. And again, remembering that almost anything could become critical. Uh, this figure here is just really to illustrate why minerals as such, why are minerals really important? And they are of course important because we use them for everything that we do. And when we talk about the critical minerals or the minerals that we need for the energy transition. You can also see them in this, in this diagram here. You have a wind turbine in the background there. You have lots of transportation on here, getting that green, getting that electrified. It all requires different types of raw materials. And so sort of a Europe, Europe-centric view here again of why is this so important. But basically in Europe, there is not a lot of, of primary production of metals and, and, and minerals. But once you start moving downstream in the value chain into the sort of manufacturing, uh, uh, the processing industries and the actual manufacturing, the, the industry, the apples and Audis of this world, then you see that the, the number of jobs and the value added to society is increasing tremendously. These figures are from, from JRC and probably uh, almost not 10 years old now, but still very valid. And interestingly, again, we can put almost any sector sort of superimposed onto this, and, and it would be true for all of them. They all actually start with the raw materials that go into the products that are produced. So again, it all starts with the rock, starts with identifying the minerals, finding the minerals, mining the mineral, and then we have a whole value chain that comes after that. And so if you look at it historically, where do we get the metals from? If you go back more than 100 years, almost 200 years now, the main producer in the world was Europe here in the, in the blue stippled line, overtaken by the United States around 1900 and up through the World War years. But from around 1970, several other regions across the world are coming in to the production so that we today see a much more balanced, you could say, uh, production actually across the world. But quite interestingly, 
you see Europe and the United States at the bottom now. So around now we are down to, in Europe, down to something like three to 5%. We're consuming perhaps 15 to 20% and uh, uh, or maybe even higher than that, I think 25 to 30%. And similarly for the US, we are down at around so 5% of the, of the global production, but as we all know, a much, much larger proportion of the actual consumption or the use of metals. And this of course creates import dependency. And import dependency alone does not make something critical, but it's one of those things that can play into criticality because if it is uh, import dependence from areas that are for some reason uh, subject to geopolitical turbulence or uh, monopolies, then it can actually become a risk. And here what we see is the import dependency for Europe uh, for a variety of elements, and you can see sort of out on the right-hand side, you have iron ore, zinc and copper, chromium. So some of the, the, the uh, ores that we've been using for a really long time, but on the right-hand side, you see a lot of these speciality metals that actually go into new energy technologies. And as you can see for Europe, we have an import dependency of 100% for all these. So this is a huge issue that sort of me means that we have to look at how are we going to make sure that we will have a secure supply. And one of the solutions, if you Google circular economy and images on Google, this is what I did here. And this is just a tiny, tiny sort of uh, field of view from what comes up on Google. You literally get hundreds and hundreds of things that look like this. Many of these are sort of ways that we think about circular economy. Many of them are green because that makes them look more attractive. Many of them are completely closed loop. And it is brought forward as one of the solutions to securing mineral supply. Let's close the loops. Let's recycle so that we can just get everything that we need from things that we already have in um, the products that we are using. And so is this actually a viable option? And of course, there's two things that sort of mainly enters into this. And one is what is actually the demand of what we need? And the second one is how good are we actually recycling? And I'll say just a little bit more about those two. So demand, what we are seeing is that we have a population increase across the globe. And so while it is still uncertain exactly what this is gonna look like going forward, it is pretty certain that we're gonna be more and more people. And not only are we gonna be more and more people, we actually also use more minerals and metals per person historically. And this is a, a figure out of, uh, of uh, Gradle's group at, uh, at Yale University. And what you can see here is that around 1900, there was, if we normalize the use of certain metals, uh, at that time and then look at how much we're actually using today on the y-axis on a logarithmic scale, what you will see is that there's maybe a handful of minerals that we're using almost the same as we did a uh, hundred years ago, things like lead, silver, and tin. But if you look at a wide variety of other metals, uh, again, for example, iron, zinc, and copper, we are looking at between five and 10 times as much per person remembering that we are three times, four times as many people today as well as we were back then. So the demand just out of the sheer volumes that we're all using is a huge, uh, delivering a huge uh, demand increase on minerals in general. John sort of alluded to this as well. Another thing that plays into this is what is it we're using then? Well, if you go back long enough, we just used flint. But when you go back, you know, 300 years, uh, 400 years, we were using metals, but we weren't using very many different metals. And as our technologies have become more advanced, we are using more and more different metals. And on the right there, you can see we're pretty much using the entire periodic table, as John also pointed out today, and we're using them for these energy technologies. And quite interestingly, of course, if we didn't use it before, it's not actually going to be there for us to recycle. And if you look at the energy transition, that's exactly what has happened. We've, we're going, what we want to do is we want to go from a brown economy of combustion type energy technologies to a green economy where we have functional materials and e-motors and, and energy storage and energy conversion. And we're looking at those elements that you saw that import dependency as well. It's cobalt, it's lithium, it's the platinum group metals, rare earth, and so forth. 
So there is an enormous need for these metals today. And we didn't have that need if you go back just 20 or 30 years. And this illustrates that. And this is out of the, um, the report that came out of the World Bank that John also mentioned. And as you can see on the left here, you have a variety of metals again uh, in sort of the vertical column, starting with uh, aluminum and ending with zinc. And, and then you can see sort of uh, boxes checked against different energy technologies at the top here. And you can see where we need the different types of metals and minerals, and we need them a lot. And in this study, they've also looked at what do we think actually the demand is going to be as we move forward. And looking towards 2050, this is only 30 years away, this is what it looks like for those exact same elements. What we're seeing here is an increase, for example, for, for something like graphite, lithium, and cobalt of more than 400%. So four times as much demand as we have today for those metals. And even the ones where we're not predicting uh, um, very large increases, we are talking about increase in demand of all of these metals as we go forward. The other aspect of the um, circular economy, of course, is how good are we actually at recycling? How good are we at retrieving the metals that we're using? And again, I want to go back to Gradle's group, and I'm trying, going to try to go through this one fast. One can speak about this one for 20 minutes alone. But basically, what Gradle's group did it, it, it was they looked at the, pretty much the entire periodic table, not everything, but many metals in the, uh, in the uh, periodic table. And they looked at what enters into production manufacturing. That's seen here in the dark blue. Of that, so that gets into products, how much is actually um, going into real products and what is actually sort of lost off to the wayside here. And that's the next blue color you have here in use products. So these are our cars and our computers and our everything that we're using. Then onto the next blue, that's actually what is potentially recyclable. What can we actually recycle? Because there's things we can't recycle. We don't have the technologies to recycle them or the, or the means to actually collect them. These are things like rare earths and polishing materials and aluminum and steel making. So of what actually enters into the production stream, it's only a portion of it that we actually potentially can recycle. And how much do we then perhaps recycle because we are recovering it and that is sort of shown here in green. So again, we're losing a lot to our drawers back at home and putting things into the wrong bins when we're actually trying to collect our waste. Also, what's missing on this figure, of course, I'm a geologist, is the mining. And if you know about mining and you could hear a lot of the, the people uh, certainly in the, in, the, in the panel here knows about mining, this is the place where we introduce an enormous amount of waste. There's always going to be a waste rock. There's going to be rock that has, has lower concentrations than what we're wanting, and we're not going to process that. And so a lot of material actually gets lost already in the mining phase and in the tailings when we're doing mining. This is the result of the study um, uh, coming out of this back from 2015. And as you can see, there's a lot of metals here in blue, which are the ones that we're actually fairly good at, uh, at, at recycling, again, potentially recyclable. But there's also quite a lot of yellow on, it, on here. This is the stuff that we cannot currently recycle. So uh, a lot of the rare earths uh, on here, as you can see, and a lot of other speciality metals, again, these are the ones that we want so badly. We're actually really, really bad at recycling them. And when you look at what we actually do recycle, that is actually reflected in the numbers here. This is coming out of a resource panel, a UN resource panel report from 2011, and it has not improved very much in the 10 years since. We are pretty good at the ones that were also blue in the other, in the other figure, but the reds on here signify that we are actually only recycling up to a percent, one percent of something that in some cases, we're gonna see doubling or tripling of this, the demand of those. And finally, I wanna to return to this figure as well, because back to this thing of what we're using now, what we're using in the past, part of the circular economy concept is also that we wanna we want to design things for reuse and we want to design things to last for a long time. Well, if we're designing a wind turbine to last for a long time, it's not going to be available for us to recycle 
for a long time either. So as long as things are in stock and as long as, long as we're using them, they're not gonna be available for us to recycle. This is a recycling plant in, uh, in Ghana. And so just sort of to, to summarize that even though we have this tendency to sort of wanna see things as closed green loops and thinking then, then we can all support it and then we can all be for it. It's actually not that simple. It's extremely complex how we're securing our access to minerals and especially the minerals that we need for this energy transition. So rather than think about these closed loops, I'd like to advocate for this way of thinking about the raw material value chain, the mineral value chain and the circular economy. We do need to get things into the loop. Even if we had a case of a falling demand of something, we at some point in time, we had to put them into the loop by extracting them from the ground. We should not lose sight of that. We should continue to have the conversation about how that portion of the value chain can become more sustainable uh, and, and what we need in this part of the value chain to be able to secure the green transition that we actually want. So we need to focus on this as well. We need to focus on the entire understanding of the value chain, going from the exploration and mining into processing, into the design and production of things, as we mentioned, as I mentioned before, into the use, into the collection, into the recycling. And we need to acknowledge that there's leakage along this entire value chain. There's waste everywhere we go. People talk about zero waste, but in reality, it is almost impossible to imagine that we can do that. But we need to look at where we have waste and where we can minimize uh, waste. So this is how I, sort of, I like to advocate for us to be thinking about securing the supply of this. And I'd actually like to just throw in there maybe for the discussion that what about these guys here? I mean, in the, in the past, it's only been, you know, the geologists and the miners up here that worried about where the raw materials came from. From these guys down here, again, the Apples and Audis and Siemens, for them, they've been buying it off the shelf at market value, and they have not necessarily paid too much attention to where did it come from and where's it going. Actually, there's been good business model in designing something for breaking fairly quickly so that they would have, you'd have to buy a new one. What if we can get these guys to take some responsibility for the sourcing of raw materials and also for the recycling of raw materials? Then I think we have some chance of really talking about a sustainable supply chain for everything that we need. And we do need a sustainable supply chain for this reason here. Again, the one we'll be talking about very much in this webinar series is the affordable and clean energy. That's what we want. We're gonna need raw materials to go into that, and we're going to have to talk honestly and openly about the complexity of getting them there. So with that, I'm going to say thank you for listening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Karen. Excellent presentation. Really, really interesting and stimulating. So now we'll move on to our second speaker. That's Nadel Nassar. And Nadell is the chief of the material flow analysis section of the National Minerals Information Center of the USGS. Uh, he's got a, a BS in chemical engineering, uh, his MBA in sustainable global enterprise from Cornell and a PhD uh, from Yale. He's a member of the US National Science and Technology Council's Critical Minerals Subcommittee and uh, he significantly was the 2019 recipient of the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. So uh, welcome, Nadal, and please go ahead. Great, thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction and for the opportunity to share some of the research that my group and I have been doing at, at uh, USGS. Let's see if I can um, <clears throat> get this going. Okay, so... Um, I'm, I'm really fortunate to, to be here and talk to you about this and also to follow up from Karen's presentation because I think it really builds off of that uh, discussion. So I'll just briefly talk about the demand side, but then quickly jump into uh, talking more about the supply side. In terms of demand, you know, for uh, mineral commodities, mineral commodities are really essential for both conventional as well as renewable energy technologies, including solar photovoltaics, as we talked about, uh, wind turbines, especially offshore wind turbines with the rare earth. Uh, but also things like oil drilling with barite as oil and gas drilling mugs, uh, and as well as uh, petroleum refining, such as platinum and rhenium, as reforming catalysts. Um, gas turbine blades, uh, they require super alloys for industrial gas turbine blades, and they require a number of different alloying elements there. 
And of course, uh, the technology that everybody's talking about with electrical vehicles and energy storage with lithium ion batteries, really probably one of the largest, if not the largest transition that's gonna to happen to the energy system in the last few decades. And this is obviously a big deal for mineral commodities um, and the demand for mineral commodities. A lot of the concern, however, is on the supply side. Um, and the reason for that is because production for mineral, of mineral, mineral commodities is highly concentrated in a few countries. And so you have countries like uh, Brazil that dominate niobium production, um, South Africa dominates the platinum group metals, Chile is the dominant player for uh, rhenium, uh, DR Congo for uh, cobalt and tantalum, uh, Australia and Canada provide a lot of different commodities, uh, and China, I think, is the big story, uh, producing much of everything else. And if you look at this data over time, what you see is that this is a relatively new phenomena. So this is showing uh, China's share of global production, uh, primary production of, of various mineral commodities. Uh, you can see things like the rare earth have been dominant uh, since the 1990s. This is showing time series from 1990 to 2018. Uh, antimony, same. Uh, tungsten as well. Uh, but for some of the other commodities, uh, their share of global production has really increased just over these last couple of decades, including magnesium metal, uh, gallium, and cobalt refining. And so as was alluded uh, in the previous presentation, what this has resulted in is many de developed countries are increasingly import reliant. So this is a metric uh, of net import reliance that our uh, center has been um, measuring for many decades. And when you look at the number of commodities for which the United States is at least 25% import reliant, meaning at least 25% of US consumption is based on foreign imports. That number has increased from 21 commodities in the 50s to almost 60 commodities today. Now, in a recent executive order, we were asked to examine, well, where are we uh, getting, what's our foreign reliance? Where are we getting these mineral commodities? And that's what's shown in these uh, three different periodic table figures with the overall periodic table figure shown in the three, three colors. So we get a lot of uh, mineral commodities either from domestic sources or from what Department of Defense calls security supply countries. There are a few commodities, including the rare earths and many of the, the metalloids that are used in, for example, solar photovoltaics. That we do get from what Department of Commerce labels as non-market economies. Namely, this is China. And then we get uh, some of the other commodities from, from elsewhere. And so you might, uh, you know, the viewer might look at this and say, well, that's not too bad. It's just a few, you know, commodities. But what this picture does not show um, is the import reliance on semi-finished and finished goods, right? So you might be importing a flat panel display or a finished vehicle. And that's not, that would not be shown here. Here, it's really talking about the raw materials. And so we're investigating this embedded demand to understand our foreign reliance more completely to understand uh, the dependency on not just the raw materials, but raw materials contained in finished goods. One thing we did a couple of years ago was to examine uh, US reliance relative to Chinese import reliance. And we know China has a lot, but they don't have everything that they need. So we put this uh, relatively simple matrix to try to understand where do things fall. And so things in quadrant one are things for which the US and China are less than 50% net import reliant. Molybdenum falls in the bottom left quadrant because both China and the US are net exporters. Quadrant two are commodities for which the US is highly net import reliant, but China is not. So the rare earths, um, as, at least as of this writing in 2014 um, data, uh, the US was highly import reliant, China is not. Other minor metals like indium, uh, gallium, bismuth fall into that category. The converse of, of, of that situation is in, in quadrant three. So you have here a beryllium where the US is the largest uh, producer and not by accident, there's a significant effort on the part of the uh, Department of Defense through the Title III um, Defense Production Act to make sure that there's a, a strong and reliable uh, beryllium supply chain. You might be also surprised to see iron and copper in this quadrant. Uh, China is, is a big producer, but their consumption is even greater uh, than, uh, than their production, so it falls in that quadrant. Quadrant four is perhaps the most interesting because these are commodities for which both the U.S and China are highly knit import reliant. So the platinum group metals that are mined in South Africa fall in this quadrant, niobium in Brazil, uh, rhenium in Chile, lithium in, in Australia and Latin America. Now you'll notice here, uh, cobalt is, is sort of in two spots. You, you might've noticed that there's cobalt with a subscript R and a cobalt with a subscript M in quadrants two and three uh, respectively. 
the R is, stands for refined production and the M stands for mining production. And what's why they're in different quadrants is because China, while they don't mine a significant uh, quantity of cobalt, they are a major refiner. And we can see that through our data from our mineral yearbooks. What's shown here is from 1980 to around 2018, 2016. Um, world production by country. And you see global mine production for cobalt is dominated for in, in the DRC, but global refinery production is really dominated in China. Um, and of course, cobalt is important because it's used in lithium ion batteries. It's one of the key components in cathodes. And, and this is not by accident. Um, if you look at what's going on, uh, a lot of Chinese firms have gone to the DRC in Central Africa to make sure that they have equity stake in, in those mineral assets and processing facilities so that they're able to ship a lot of that cobalt to China for further refining and ultimately processing and incorporation into lithium ion batteries and, and, and vehicles and electronics, et cetera. And it's not just for cobalt, um, Chinese firms that have invested in uh, at mineral assets for uh, niobium in Brazil, lithium in Australia and Chile, Rares and of course, Greenland and the mountain pass mine in, in the United States. So that's what China's doing. They're making sure that they're able to secure their resources for their manufacturing sector. You might be wondering, well, what is the US government doing? We do have a, a standing committee that's been around for more than a decade under the US National Science Technology Council. It's a, a critical mineral subcommittee that's co-chaired by both Department of Energy and Department of Interior. And it uh, has representation from across the federal agencies uh, and this subcommittee uh, has really been at the center of a lot of the efforts for the federal government um, on the executive branch side uh, to, to help um, develop a, a strategy and, and, and um, deliver it. And it's, it's uh, also been following on a lot of the executive orders that have been coming through in the last couple of years. Uh, I'll just go through those really quickly. Um, some of the, uh, the ones that have come down in the last couple of years, including executive order 13817, which um, really set up the language to um, suggest that we need to develop a critical minerals list for the United States. Uh, that was followed up um, with the Defense uh, Production Act Title III, uh, several uh, five presidential determinations that required the Department of Defense to secure rare earth supply chains. Uh, that was in 2019. In September, 2020, there was another executive order uh, that looked at addressing the threat of domestic, uh, for domestic supply chains on foreign reliance. Um, and so that language also in that executive order required that the critical minerals list be updated and reviewed periodically. Uh, even more recently in December of last year, uh, the Energy Act of 2020, uh, which was part of the omnibus, uh, included a section on mineral security that uh, put into legislation the requirement that the US uh, provide a critical minerals list and updated every three years. And finally, most recently, just in February, uh, the Biden administration put out Executive Order 14017, which looked at American supply chains, including one on critical minerals, but also uh, on semiconductors, lithium ion batteries, or batteries in general, and pharmaceuticals, all of which require mineral commodities. And so there's been a lot of action within the executive branch and, and the legislation uh, to help uh, resolve some of these issues. One of the central things that, that our center has been working on is to try to define that critical minerals list. And so this is a publication that we put out um, in 2020 that try to address, well, how do you define criticality and how do you measure it? And really what we honed in on was uh, to look at supply risk. And here we define supply risk using a, a conventional risk modeling framework where there has to be a hazard, in this case, a, a supply disruption, a high degree of supply disruption. You have to be exposed to that hazard and you have to be vulnerable to it. And the idea there is all those components are necessary for there to be risk. And conversely, if you think about it, you need to reduce only one of them for the risk to go away. Um, and so we went about developing indicators uh, for each of those uh, components of supply risk, and we're able to um, measure uh, semi-quantitatively what the supply risk would be across 50 plus mineral commodities over a decade. And the things that came out on top are things that you would expect, the rare earth elements, and, and cobalt, graphite, antimony, tantalum, tungsten, et cetera. What we also are able to do is identify not only the leading producer, but which applications, which uses are these, um, is really driving the vulnerability. Now we're not standing still, we're looking at improving this methodology and updating it. We'll be updating it to include data up to year 2018, 
hopefully in the next week or so that uh, those results will be published and they'll directly feed into providing the technical input document uh, for updating the critical minerals as for the US government. We're also looking to enhance the methodology as we are able to uh, do more and more uh, on each of the components. So for the vulnerability component, we're looking at figuring out how can we look at the ripple on effects to understand how does uh, supply disruption impact uh, the, the end user and the economy overall. And on the hazard side, we're looking at other hazards. So right now our, our focus has been on man-made hazards, right? So political instability in a, in a producing country, but there are other hazards, including natural hazards, which can affect supplies. This is a work we did a couple of years ago, looking at earthquake supply disruptions for copper in Latin America uh, to try to understand, well, what's the expected annual disruption um, due to earthquakes? You can imagine expanding this um, so we are expanding this globally, and we'll have that result hopefully later this year, but expanding it to potentially other commodities and, and other hazards, natural hazards as well, and ultimately reincorporating that back into our criticality model. Now, once you identify a commodity as critical, you know, what, what can you do about it, or how can you think about what's, what, what are ways to reduce it? So as I mentioned earlier, um, there, you, know, you can reduce any one of those three components. You can either reduce the hazard, you can reduce the exposure, or you can reduce the vulnerability. If we think about just the exposure piece of it, uh, which is essentially our import reliance, right? You're uh, more exposed to it if you are uh, more import reliant. What we can do is we can develop scenarios. So let's take this illustrative scenario. So our domestic demand maybe is increasing, our domestic supply is decreasing. The difference between those is our import reliance or net import reliance. And if we develop different scenarios, um, we can see you know, how might that change over time. And then you can develop these wedges to understand, well, how can different, um, tools that are you know, in our toolkit might be able to reduce that import line. So we can develop manufacturing improvements such as 3D printing or near net shape forging. We can develop substitute materials. On the supply side, perhaps we try to increase domestic supplies, a primary or secondary through recycling. Um, of course, there are limitations to each of these strategies. We can, um, you can have our uh, Department of State, Department of Commerce work on securing those supplies through trade ties. And what's left over maybe can be secured through government or industry stocks to buffer against any, any supply disruption. So this sort of illustrative idea is, uh, you know, this is how we can get there if that's our um, policy goal. The question, of course, then becomes, well, how big are each of these wedges for the different commodities? And they'll be different, right? Um, and so that's one thing that we hope to do. And um, with a few minutes that I'll have left, I'll just uh, show you a little bit of illustration of what, what that might look like. So we know, for example, this is uh, data from the Energy Information Administration. Um, and this was before the, the latest um, announcement from, from the Biden administration. But we know that solar, for example, is going to become, is expected to become, comprise the largest share of globally installed electricity generation capacity. Um, other things like natural gas will continue to grow, wind will uh, grow as well. But if we think about just solar for a second, uh, we know that there's uh, many different solar uh, techno PV technologies the most dominant of which is crystalline silicon that requires silver, for example. Of the other technologies, the thin film technologies, cadmium telluride is the most dominant in the United States, comprising somewhere between 50 to 30% of annual installations um, in, in terms of um, megawatts. Um, and the question is, you know, is tellurium potentially a bottleneck? So this is something that we're investigating. We pulled together an international group of researchers to try to understand, could you increase tellurium supply Given and knowing that it is a byproduct uh, of copper production, how much could you increase tellurium supply without having to increase copper production significantly? So watch for that uh, coming in the next few months. So quickly to summarize here, so mineral commodities are essential for renewable and emerging technologies. The United States is highly import reliant for a large and growing number of those commodities. As, as Karen mentioned, uh, import reliance by itself is not necessarily uh, uh, a cause for concern or uh, but it is a component of risk. And when combined with other factors such as production concentration in unable or unwilling countries that uh, might be unable or unwilling to supply the United States and industries that might be vulnerable, you have a situation where there is risk. We've developed this risk-based um, uh, assessment for the United States. We will use that to update and prioritize the critical minerals list. There is a federal strategy out there um, that the NSTC critical mineral subcommittee is, is um, implementing. And we believe scenario analysis can help us identify which of those strategies will be most effective at reducing both import reliance and supply risk overall for the United States. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Nadal. A great presentation. Excellent. We'll move on to our third presentation. And this is Erez Ishilov. He's the managing director of Traxxas Group and, and specifically a legacy investment arm Traxxas Projects and the new battery materials and ESG focused investment arm Traxxas Battery Holdings. He uh, has a, an LLB from Tel Aviv University and an MBA as well. His prior roles were deputy CEO of the a global ferro nickel group. And he has a focus on investment projects in the metals and, and mining and metals sector, obviously focused around the emerging uh, electrical revolution. Erez, over to you. Hello, everyone. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be here. And it was great to, uh, to listen and watch uh, the previous presenters, which I think uh, by uh, providing both the um, the more academic angle and the uh, executive arm uh, uh, point of view um, kind of allow me to lead it a little bit more to the, uh, you know, how we do it uh, on the ground. Um, Traxxas is a company that builds and, uh, and provides services to, to supply chains, historically to uh, aluminum, to, uh, to the stainless steel supply chain, super alloys, uh, uh, chemical industries, et cetera. And uh, in the past few years, we, uh, I think we kind of saw the, uh, the writing on the wall and we realized that um, you know, green, uh, green supply chains and, uh, and a new way of doing things will also require um, service providers and commodity houses that, uh, you know, that work um, ethically and uh, conscientiously and uh, you know, make sure that, um, that we can help uh, people care and uh, entities care now where things are coming from and where they end. Um, so we, uh, you know, that's, that's how we're doing uh, things today. And we shifted more and more towards the, uh, towards these materials. Some of them we've been, you know, have been part of previous supply chains, but, you know, have uh, transitioned in terms of how they are used. But cobalt is a, is a good example. Uh, already, I think 40% or 50% of the cobalt produced every year is, is used in batteries. And if you scroll back 10, 15 years ago, it, the number was much smaller and it was, much more of a yeah of a super alloy and uh, and uh, stainless and specific alloy type of type of material, um, and uh, we teamed up um, in the past couple of years with uh, Pallinghurst, which was a uh, legacy uh, mining investment uh, fund, and uh, also transitioned in parallel into investing in the uh, materials that will enable the uh, transition into uh, electro mobility and uh, and renewable energy, and um, the way we see it basically, and I'll dive into the presentation uh, uh, right away, is that um, in order to really um, change the world within this century, there are a lot of things that need to happen. Um, and the UN targets are some of them, of course, but uh, you know, there's, we need to uh, plant, uh, plant more trees, uh, release less methane, eat less cows, uh, change the cooling systems and our ACs and fridges. And, uh, and obviously, um, uh, develop our onboard um, um, uh, lithium uh, lithium battery and, and other storage systems, which enable electro mobility, clean, green, uh, no noise, no pollution, and um, and the switch to renewable to renewable energy. And we asked ourselves, as uh, as, as Traxxas, um, as we do our ten year plan you know, moving forward, where can we make a difference? And the place where we can make a difference is on the materials. So we chose to focus on, um, on battery materials and uh, building the supply chains and investing in the, um, in the um, projects that will lead uh, both to primary extraction and to recycling. So invested in, uh, in a graphite project in Quebec called Nouveau Monde and a lithium project called Namaska and a recycling company called Lifecycle. And, uh, and we'll do a lot more. Um, I'll share my screen with you now. And, um, let me know if it works. You're on. Good. Can you see me? Can you see the screen? Yes. Great. So I won't repeat that, but um, as I was mentioning, we're a uh, global commodity uh, commodity house. Uh, we've been founded in 2003. Our main shareholder is the Carlyle Group, uh, the uh, Blue Chip American uh, Fund. And um, 
the Lewis Bacon funds also have a piece and uh, there are shares with the management and employees. We have more than a hundred partners in our firm. Um, these uh, lithium ion, uh, ion batteries and, and the materials that are used for them, um, which are at the moment uh, pretty much all defined as, criti as critical materials uh, in all standards. So we're looking at lithium graphite, the NMC, lithium cobalt manganese, and of course copper, which is the most important material for uh, enabling electrification. There's about four times more copper in an EV than there is in a ICE, and of course all the charging size stations, all the infrastructure, there's gonna be a lot more cobalt needed. And then these, um, these batteries um, go into energy storage, the stationary uh, grid scale, micro, et cetera. Um, and into the uh, electromobility of the EVs, and, uh, but not only, uh, uh, forklifts, drones, uh, trucks, uh, and so on. The interesting thing, um, I think, um, is that um, there is a somewhat of a circular aspect here because um, we will be uh, more and more charging our electric uh, vehicles with uh, renewable energy, uh, renewable uh, or energy produced by renewable sources. And this answers to some of the critique that was heard five and 10 years ago when people were saying, uh, what good are you doing when you're driving an electric car that was charged by a uh, cold fired uh, uh, electricity uh, in the back end, to some extent you're only pushing the, the problem backwards in the, uh, in the energy supply chain. Um, to my mind, this was not 100% true because having, uh, you know, uh, getting rid of exhaust pipes with all the, uh, effects it has on pollution and health. And uh, just think about the level of noise in some of the uh, city centers uh, and so on. Uh, going electric has a lot of value uh, uh, regardless, but, um, but when you combine the two and uh, you will be driving, you will be moving around uh, on uh, that way, it's, it's obviously uh, a perfect solution. And um, one of the things that's also um, developing, but that's part of, um, that's part of improvements on, on grid level, on grid management, and there's a lot of software, uh, and a lot of it is uh, mass data and AI driven on how um, you know, you're, um, you're staying at home because you're only gonna work 50% uh, in the office uh, from next year onwards, and uh, you charge your car during the night, and during the day it returns the, uh, because you're not going to the office on that day. It uploads the power back into the grid, so actually these, um, onboard mobile solutions also act as, uh, as some kind of a, of a balancing solution for, uh, uh, for, for sort of micro peakers, if you will. Um, in terms of uh, growth, um, everyone was talking about the, uh, the huge surge in demand and uh, how the uh, supply side will need to answer. So I won't go too deeply into that, but if we're looking at, um, at stationary storage solutions and, um, and grid solutions, we can see here that uh, there's going to be, I'm sorry, there's going to be um, huge, uh, a huge number of gigawatt hour, um, gigawatt hour um, batteries installed. This is um, uh, from, uh, from Bloomberg and this excludes uh, pump storage hydro. This is really uh, all, the other, all the other solutions and most of them are obviously the lithium ion batteries. And you can see, which is interesting here, and this is something that a narrative that um, that was pointed to before, but we'll see as we as we continue, that um, in terms of where the markets are, in terms of installing uh, stationary uh, storage solutions or or buying cars, um, we sort of have um, China, Europe, uh, North America, and rest of the world more or less equal uh, in very round numbers here in this. Uh, specific uh, slide, the uh, rest of Asia was broken away from, from China, but um, in, in other slides, it's not. And as you scroll to EVs, um, we see here that uh, we expect within this decade an adoption rate growth from approximately 2.5% last year to about a third of the uh, new um, passenger cars and light duty vehicles. So at the end of the decade being uh, electric and most of them will be uh, battery EV and um, some of them will still be uh, plug-in hybrids, but not a lot. So uh, these two trends uh, will create uh, obviously a huge uh, increase in the demand for the materials that, um, that uh, these batteries are made of. 
Um, again, just looking at it from from the, from the market uh, perspective, and this will help us when we kind of superposition again um, everything from the upstream to the downstream. Um, we see that uh, in terms of uh, vehicles sold, again we have more or less um, three major markets and the rest of the world. Now um, going to the um, to the to the to the, to the um, downstream and, and upstream and, and how these uh, how these things are, are made. We see that by the end of the year, Benchmark Minerals, which is the main uh, information collection uh, agency for uh, for these materials and for these uh, supply chains, uh, we'll have about 200 uh, gigafactories up and running in the world by the end of the year. We can see that definitely this is becoming part of the mainstream. Uh, you see that everyone remembers, I guess, the. Uh, the Will Ferrell commercial from the uh, from the Super Bowl, and um, what we can see here is that um, uh, although, as we saw earlier, the markets are distributed in one way, the customers are where they are. When you look at um, at uh, at cell manufacturing and OEMs, where where do th these things happen? We see that approximately seventy five percent is in China, only about five percent in the U.S. and ten percent in Europe, and uh, Europe. Although it's only 10% at the moment, it's it's going to grow, and a lot of good brands are already represented there, and and more more coming uh, coming into uh, into production. But if you look at China and Japan, Korea, mainly if you kind of add these two together, we're talking about 85% of the production ha happening in the Asia Pacific supply chain, if you will, while the call it Pan Atlantic is only about 15%. So it's about 50% of the consumer market and installations of stationary story, but it's only about 30% of the of the final downstream at the moment. Um, drilling down a little bit into the into the materials, I'm sure you'll do more of that in the next seminars with people who are more uh, qualified than a lawyer with an MBA. But um, basically, the battery has you know the two electrodes, the positive cathode, cathode and the negative anode and a separator, which has to be porous to allow the uh, lithium ions to carry electrons from side to side and, and charge and discharge. Um, the um, chemistries of the, uh, of the cathode, the, the popular one that everyone's talking about now is the NMC, which is uh, nickel, cobalt, and manganese, and, uh, and of course, lithium. Um, we'll talk about it later, but lithium in that context is consumed mainly as lithium hydroxide because in the baking process of the uh, precursor materials, as we call them, uh, we're reaching higher temperatures and uh, lithium carbonate cannot sustain them, so you need lithium hydroxide. Um, NCA is, uh, is basically what Tesla is using, um, and that's uh, nickel, cobalt, aluminum, again with, uh, with, lithium, with lithium carbonate. And um, LFP is lithium iron phosphate, which is a uh, cheaper, more stable uh, way of, uh, of producing the, the cathode. It's very popular in China. Um, Tesla is actually gonna use it for its Chinese uh, Model 3. And um, people thought it was gonna go away in favor of the uh, nickel rich uh, chemistries and that within the nickel rich chemistries, we'll get rid of the uh, 532 and 622 and shift to the holy grail of 811, which means eight units of nickel uh, to uh, one unit of cobalt and one unit of manganese. But it turns out that it's that it's not really the case. There are improvements on the LFP. Um, there are improvements uh, on how to make um, uh, nickel rich, but less nickel rich type of type of chemistries. And um, we'll see later, I guess there's no one size fits all and it will be depending on the application. An entry level urban vehicle doesn't necessarily need what a uh, weekend sports car needs and so on. On the anode side at the moment, the um, dominant technology is, is a graphite anode. And um, graphite is uh, as a combination in this respect of natural graphite and, uh, and synthetic graphite and some silicon. Um, there's an attempt because of cost and availability to, uh, to increase the amount of silicon, but um, there are limits to that because silicon tends to uh, expand, uh, which, uh, which causes a problem. So there's sort of a cap at the moment to how much you can use it. And at the moment it's somewhere around 10%. Uh, 
might push higher, but not a lot. And between the natural and the synthetic, the effort is to increase the natural component because synthetic comes from, uh, uh, from the, it's a byproduct of, of oil refining, um, needle coke basically, but, um, but there are also caps on that. Everyone's talking about solid state and the lithium metal um, uh, anode, but, but that's gonna take a while and is probably going to be again, application specific. specific. The most popular electrolyte uh, obviously is, the, uh, is lithium ion lithium in solution, which um, works in essence as a stevedore carrying the anodes from, from side, I'm sorry, the uh, electrons from side to side. Uh, as we look at the supply chain uh, from um, mining to uh, initial refining and conversion, then making of cathodes, anodes, electrolyte, putting them together uh, in battery cells and then ultimately into, into batteries, uh, uh, the, putting the batteries into the electric vehicles and into the storage system. Uh, we'll talk about it in a minute, but what we see that there is a lot of investment and a lot of investment announced on the downstream side, and there's definitely a gap on the upstream and the midstream. Um, again, this connects a little bit to what we spoke of earlier, so I'll, uh, I'll run through this quickly, but this is a map, um, again, from, from Bloomberg's uh, research. Um, explaining um, where in the world are the various chemistry made of. So if you look to the, uh, to the left, you will basically see uh, Tesla with its uh, NCA uh, Panasonic cells in, uh, in the United States. Uh, you will see that in Europe, um, most of what is made is, is NMC. And uh, you can see that in, the, uh, in, in China, China and race, the Asia Pacific, let's call it China, Japan, Korea cluster, uh, they're pretty much making everything and, and, and rather dominant on that. Um, and um, what we are seeing now is that um, because it's not one size fits all and because there's a realization that um, you to some extent need to customize your, your chemistry, not only to the availability of materials, but also to, um, to the specific application. Uh, there's a difference between a drone, a forklift, a taxi, and, uh, you know, and a sports car, um, there's, um, it's very important to figure out and to optimize relatively quickly uh, your composition and how you're gonna get to it. And uh, we're seeing now that there are some uh, interesting startups that are, um, um, will probably surface uh, later this year that want to provide, uh, provide that angle and enable the, uh, the producers and the, the OEMs, the brands, uh, the designers to be able to relatively quickly uh, optimize the uh, recipe, if you will, for the battery that they need for their application or product, and then transition that into, um, into design, into procurement and so on. Um, again, connecting to the, um, to, the whole, to the whole narratives, if you just look at, uh, at the big four, let's call it lithium, uh, graphite, uh, nickel and cobalt, we see that um, through this decade, uh, we're gonna to need uh, to quadruple, if not more, our natural graphite uh, production. And we're going to uh, need another million tons of, of nickel, class one nickel, nickel sulfate or nickel that can be made into nickel sulfate and actually go into a battery. When you see in 2020, uh, 343,000 uh, uh, tons of nickel uh, in, this, in this graph, this is the nickel that was used in batteries but 2.3 million tons of nickel are produced per annum. But um, just the cumulative annual growth rate, uh, which has to do mainly with uh, population growth and uh, infrastructure stimulus, et cetera, would, uh, would not take us to this incremental million in five years. Uh, in 2025, if you add this extra million, we'll have 3.3 million in total. And at that point in time, we'll have a, uh, more than a third of that already going into batteries. And if you go to the end of the decade, once again, about half the nickel that will produce, be produced at that time will go into batteries. At the moment, it's going mainly into uh, stainless steel. Um, look at lithium. Lithium is gonna need uh, another 2 million tons of LCE by the end of the decade. Um, that's uh, again, five-fold uh, five jump and um, in order for these uh, materials to actually, for the supply to actually meet the demand, as I think everyone uh, understands, uh, recycling is an important part and we invest in recycling. Um, 
but the definition of end of life is not exactly clear because there's an effort made to uh, actually make these batteries last for a very long time. Uh, so part of it is, is scrap in production. A lot of it is uh, electronic scrap, but it's gonna take a while before a lot of EVs will retire to a level where they can be substantially recycled. And then of course, there are all the limitations on uh, what could actually be recovered and how, uh, how efficient we are in, on, on recovering. But it's all part of the same picture. And the good thing about recycling, I think, in this supply chain is that it's happening hand in hand with the growth of the uh, primary um, uh, resource extraction and conversion. Uh, previously, um, you know, the primary extraction or primary con conversion led to huge mountains of, of tailings and slag and, uh, and um, which were basically left um, left on their own and needed to be to be managed and from time to time were tapped with some ideas on how to recover because a lot of the first extractions was not very efficient how to do something with them some of them are even polluting some are not depends if it's vanadium or, or copper um, but um, recycling was to some extent a uh, an after uh, you know an after site of sometimes decade after primary extraction where someone said, look, there's, um, there's something that's either valuable or hazardous, let's, let's take another look at it. Today, it's totally different. Uh, we see that uh, recycling and the whole circular model is, is growing hand in hand. We saw that the EU uh, already created hurdles for using uh, recycled materials in a growing percentage in this supply chain. And we see that um, both an independent recycling capability, independent recycling capabilities are emerging and um, let's call it in-house or spin-off recycling capabilities are emerging. So Northvolt, for example, which is going to be a huge uh, cell manufacturer in Sweden and Germany, working closely with VW, um, they're all already developing um, an in-house capacity for, um, for recycling, which is important. Um, and then again, looking at, um, you know, this, um, uh, disparity between where the customers are, where the upstream is, the midstream, and so on. Um, just quickly, uh, the lithium that goes into these batteries, if it's, if it's hard rock, as we call it, a lot of it comes from, uh, from Australia. Some of it will come from Brazil when Sigma Lithium uh, opens up next, next year. This is um, spodumene concentrate, which basically uh, crushes pegmatites um, and then um, and then um, concentrates them to a level of, of, of 6%. Um, this happens with a, um, with a um, uh, again, in terms of, uh, of, of efficiencies, if you use uh, only a, a DMS, what we call it's probably 60, 70% uh, recovery. If you also crush everything and float, you can reach uh, probably uh, a 90% recovery in terms of you know, what you're leaving in your what you're leaving as a slag and what you're um, and what you're um, uh, recovering into into uh, into spot, you mean? But again, that's a trade-off because uh, uh, crushing requires energy and flotation requires consumables, and there's always uh, there's always a trade-off there. Then the six percent material needs to travel um, to another part of the world. Uh, typically, it goes from Australia to China, where it's further converted mainly into lithium hydroxide and in chemical plants, and then. Uh, and then the uh, lithium hydroxide or lithium carbonate can go into uh, can go into a cathode. Um, in Chile and in Argentina, it's mainly uh, it's brines, um, which are pumped and uh, historically evaporated in huge evaporation ponds for many years. But now there's a, there's an effort to work on um, on direct extraction of lithium, which basically means you filter the uh, brine uh, relatively quickly and return it to, back to the uh, to the salar, uh, which, is, to some, which is basically a salinated aquifer. And um, so there's a lot of um, tech work and uh, we're talking about all kinds of improvements um, that can also make the supply chain more efficiency. So it's not only primary and recycling, but also uh, new technologies and better ways of doing things. So uh, potential, potentially in the uh, lithium triangle of Chile, Argentina, and actually Bolivia as well, um, uh, these technologies, and it may also reflect on uh, on the lithium basin in Nevada, will perhaps allow tapping uh, more resources that at the moment have their uh, environmental and, and water balance issues. Um, 
nickel again nickel uh, uh, most of the nickel some of it uh, comes from uh, from the north from from Canada and Russia that's the primary nickel nickel sulfate mainly but um, most of the nickel is still at the moment that's mined uh, is is the laterites uh, Indonesia and the Philippines are are the biggest ones um, in Indonesia um, historically they were just mining and shipping uh, nickel laterite ore. Uh, which has about 35% uh, moisture and only about 2% nickel. Talk about uh, moving around uh, a lot of waste and a lot of water. And that also has a carbon footprint, obviously. Now, um, since 2014, uh, there are rules that require uh, local, an increased uh, component of local production. So they are producing the nickel pig iron, which goes mainly into stainless steel. And Xingxian, the Chinese producer, has announced recently that they developed a way to convert uh, NPI into nickel mat. And nickel mat is something that can be converted into nickel sulfate, which is ultimately what you need in a battery. But um, Australia also produces some, um, some nickel. And um, in essence, what you need in order to go into a battery is, is nickel sulfate and nickel salt. The easiest way to make it is from a hydroxide, nickel hydroxide or MHP, which is mixed hydroxide precipitate. Precipitate also has some cobalt. Um, we see now the emergence of some independent uh, nickel sulfate producers, which basically want to rely on buying nickel hydroxide or MHP, converting it into nickel sulfate and then selling it to the, uh, to the cathode manufacturers. Um, cobalt, again, as was mentioned uh, here before, the DRC is very dominant. Uh, had some issues that had to do more with uh, with ESG. The material in terms of quality and quantity is obviously very good. Most of it is converted then in China. So uh, cobalt uh, hydroxide becomes uh, cobalt sulfate mainly in China. And uh, you can also take cobalt metal and dissolve it into, into cobalt sulfide. Um, natural graphite is mined, crushed, concentrated. Um, and then it's it's a high grade concentrate, it's, it's in the high 90s. So when you actually move it as, as, as a concentrate, uh, you're moving a lot of material because it's a, it's a material that uh, you need a lot of, it's the biggest uh, battery material, but um, in terms of at least efficiency of moving the concentrate, you're not moving um, uh, a 6% material or a 32.5 material uh, in weight if, if you're looking at manganese and so on, but you're actually moving something that's uh, that's highly, uh, that's more concentrated, which, uh, which is a little bit more, uh, more efficient and has a lesser um, um, footprint in terms of uh, carbon emissions associated with just moving a lot of things from side to side around the world. Um, here, just um, looking again at the, um, where, where things are mined, where things are um, <clears throat> produced and where things are ultimately uh, consumed. Um, we can see again that uh, most of the anode, cathode, and, uh, and um, materials that go into them, the conversion happens in the Asia Pacific supply chain, if you will. And we see here in the Pan Atlantic, whether it's Europe or the, the North Americans, that it's a much smaller component, but it is, it is growing, at least in terms of the, of the downstream. Uh, um, then, sorry. Uh, here we have um, again from, from Benchmark's really great research uh, in their uh, in their recent presentation. They're actually showing um, how things uh, how things uh, move around and where are the uh, where does the extraction of the key material happens? Where does the chemical processing here? Where do you put it into a, an anode or a cathode or a cell? And where do you actually um, make the applications a car for that matter and uh, and use them? And uh, again, well, we see the, uh, with the same picture, if you look at it for a minute from a, from a US centric perspective, we're about 25% of, of the markets and we're very little of the in-between. Um, we're somewhat more represented and will be somewhat more represented on, uh, on the downstream, on the, um, on, the, on the gigafactory part and then put in, in the assembly actually putting these cars together. But, um, very little chemical conversion happening at the moment and very little extraction, nearly nothing and everything that's, uh, that's along this, uh, that's this critical path. Um, something to think of is that uh, a lot of these resources are actually available in Canada. 
and we as Traxxas are investing in, in Canada and we do see um, a good opportunity um, to, uh, to develop a combination of upstream and midstream conversion between the US and Canada. And we also see a um, pan-Atlantic narrative story where between, um, between Europe and between North America, um, there could be a lot of, um, a lot of synergy um, and uh, a lot of cross-pollination. And uh, I'm not talking about this from a political perspective, from, but from a practical perspective of trying to keep the supply chains short, um, just in terms of the various risks that have to do with, uh, with uh, collecting uh, materials from a lot of countries, moving them around uh, a lot of places, and um, the inefficiencies of, uh, and then carbon emissions of the, of the process. Um, and then um, I think we can uh, hop to our uh, main, uh, main conclusions and mainly points to think about. So um, we see that the rapid adoption of, uh, of EVs and the uh, deployment of stationary storage uh, will uh, create a huge increase in demand. And we're asking ourselves, how will the uh, supply side respond? There is no avoiding uh, massive expansion on the uh, primary uh, production. That means we're going to need to extract, meaning to mine, all these materials and quite a lot of them. Um, but we're gonna have to do it in, in better ways than, than was done in the past. Um, and just giving an example, uh, and again, I'm not objective because we invested in Nuvamo and Graphite, but one of the reasons we invested in them is because they will be using a um, electric uh, yellow fleet to mine um, they will be drag stacking their ta tailings in a very um, safe way, and they will be using hydropower for their uh, purification uh, process. So um, they're um, basically a, a carbon neutral uh, process making um, um, anode graphite, uh, natural spherical coated anode graphite. And um, this can happen uh, with other processes as well. So the thing is not to stop extracting or to, or to avoid it. Uh, there's simply not enough material in securation for us to say, uh, that's it, we're stopping and we're only going to recycle. Uh, we need a lot of investment and we need a lot of new projects uh, actually happening uh, on the uh, chemical conversion plant side and on the, uh, on the mine side. Uh, recycling, Definitely important, definitely something that we need to uh, do a lot more and to get better and better in doing. And just like anything else, well, um, the graph that, uh, that was shown earlier about the uh, diminishing efficiency um, as you run from, uh, you know, from, from, your, uh, from what you insert into the supply chain into what you actually reuse again, uh, hopefully these percentages will get better uh, over time. And what will enable that will be technological advantages, advances, I'm sorry, efficiencies, learning curves, and so on. It's a young supply chain. It's a long, it's a young process. And I'm sure we'll get uh, better and better in that. Um, to add the um, time, the fourth dimension into, into all of this, um, just to understand, we're talking about um, all these growth patterns on the uh, demand side by the end of the decade. It takes at least five to 10 years for a mining project to actually uh, um, reach its commissioned capacity, sometimes even longer. It takes two, three years to license and build and uh, stabilize a, uh, a complicated uh, chemical plant. So um, we need to start doing it now, or rather we should have started a few years ago because at the moment uh, availability of materials is really the, uh, perhaps the only cloud that's um, kind of casting a shadow over this and, and can potentially, potentially rain on our parade. I think um, people's hearts are already probably in the right place. The uh, executive uh, is definitely on board. Uh, there's uh, an academic consensus, regulations are in place, legislature, everything that you need is there. And I'm really concerned that the materials will, will not be, be there if we don't move quickly. Um, we see that there's a lot of investments already and a lot of investments announced in, uh, in the downstream, but really not enough uh, on, the, uh, on the upstream. You would have thought that there would be a gold rush and everyone would rush to build a nickel, uh, uh, nickel mines and, and, and uh, expedite any plans for, you know, for, for building the, the graphite uh, projects and lithium projects, but, um, but it's not happening as fast as we would like it to happen. 
um, talk about capital intensity. We're talking about big amounts here. Just to give an example, if we need 2 million tons more of, uh, of LCE, of lithium grade, uh, of, lithium, of battery grade lithium, um, the capital intensity, if you go through the hard rock route, is something like $25,000 per annualized ton. So that's on its own about $50 billion. Even if you space it over a few years, we're talking about a big amount. Nickel, capital intensity for nickel, and if you need another ton, 10, 2 million tons of that, it depends on the methodology. It varies substantially, anything from 20 to $120,000. But if you just use 50, then you see that you're at $100 billion and, um, and, and so on. Uh, graphite and copper are potentially less capital intense, but we need a lot of, we need millions of tons of more copper. Um, so really the world needs to, to start investing and to start investing uh, rather quickly. Um, another observation we had, and I think it went uh, uh, across, uh, across all three presentations, I'm sure you'll be talking about it more, is that uh, if you superposition all the maps, you will see that um, the upstream is in one place, uh, the midstream is, a, is in another, the markets are distributed sort of more, more or less evenly between the three uh, parts of the of the developed world and uh, and that creates its um, creates its issues challenges to the supply chain and companies like Traxxas um, what what we do is help sort of uh, um, grease these frictions and, uh, and and smoothen these things and enable these supply chains to move as, as efficiently as possible um, and um, avoiding situations where you know materials arrive too early or don't arrive at all or there's all kinds of uh, timing and sequencing issues. Um, there's a lot of working capital involved. We were just talking about the, uh, about the CapEx, but there's, uh, there's a, lot of that, uh, a lot of that as well. And um, so Traxxas and companies like Traxxas uh, provide the, uh, the liquidity to some extent to connect the various links in the, uh, in the chain. Um, again, as, um, uh, as this um, supply chain um, develops and, uh, and, and seeks to, uh, to find the, the best practices of anything on, and everything that's done there, a lot of the processes uh, consume a lot of energy, whether it's uh, crushing, calcining, uh, thermal purification, and so on. So um, using um, renewable energy sources to, to, to actually um, um, provide energy to these parts of the, of the process is important. And that's something that we see already in Scandinavia and uh, on both sides of the Niagara Falls, but I assume we'll, we'll see more and more of that. And perhaps in other areas of the world, it's gonna be more solar, more PV, but, but that's very important as well. Um, and then uh, last but not least, some of these processes uh, are, um, um, let's call it uh, complex, uh, complex from, from, from a chemical uh, perspective. Uh, if you take nickel, for example, you need to take uh, you need to sulfurize your nickel. You take a nickel hydroxide or a nickel metal, and then you uh, turn it into a nickel sulfide. But then when it goes into, uh, into the cathode, it has to be hydrated again. So um, it's desulfurized. And then you have a, uh, a sulfur waste at, uh, at that point, which you need to recycle uh, whatever you can and dispose of what you can't in a safe way. And that's true about pretty much, pretty much all the others. So once again, uh, if you can, either avoid some of these processes, uh, make them more efficient or just make them more regional and localized. So you move less hazardous materials or you do that for a, for a shorter period of time and, and less kilometers. That's also uh, very important. And that's it, that's a wrap. Okay, thank you very much, Erez. Very nice presentation. Um, We've got a lot of questions uh, coming in. And, uh, you know, I, I guess just, just listening to the three presentations, uh, it, you know, we're clearly on the startup ramp up curve, whatever you want to call it, of a major energy transition. And, and I guess what's really unusual about it, uh, to me anyway, is, is that it's a massive transition on the electricity supply side but also on the on the demand side on the end use and uh, this this shift um, to EVs and of course 
that the requirements for storage in large grid scale energy storage and micro scale energy storage. And clearly those are the factors that are driving, uh, going to be driving these metals and minerals requirements. I, I, I'm kind of left wondering if there's still a massive disconnect in, in an understanding of the quantities of some of these metals and minerals that are going to be required and whether we've done enough or are doing enough to quantify it. But I guess uh, just I'll jump to a couple of the questions because we've got some really good ones. Um, the first one I think is for Nadal and it's it's on phosphorus and several people on, on the chat have, have asked about phosphorus. Does it mean more phosphate mining? Is, is there more phosphorus required in the EU versus the US? Maybe Nadal, could you, you jump in and Karen, if, if you want to add? Sure, I'm happy to. So I think um, if I'm looking at the question, you know, there's, I think there's often, um, a, you know, an equivalence of importance with criticality or, or supply risk. And I think there, that's what we've sort of tried to avoid at the USGS to say, okay, all the commodities are important to somebody at some point. <laughs> But is it critical? Really, for us, means is there a supply risk? And and you know, phosphate rock is obviously very important. We really can't live without it. Um, for the United States, it's not on the critical minerals list for the United States, unlike it is for Europe, uh, for several reasons. One is that uh, the U.S. is a major producer. There are at least ten mines in the U.S. that, that mine phosphate rock, and we are less than ten percent import reliant on it. Um, and there are many many producers throughout the world, especially in in you know, in North Africa and, and West Asia. Um, and so it, we see it as a less of a concern for the United States, not to say that it's not important, it's obviously important. And I think another part of the question was, could you reuse or recycle it? I think it's, um, you know, potentially, but I think at, at currently it's, it's quite difficult, um, mainly because it's lost during use, right? So, and, and, and a lot of the, the environmental impacts that happens like eutrophication is because of that. We're not really collecting it after use. Um, and so I think, you know, there are some things that you can do a good job recycling, but economics and uh, ultimately thermodynamics plays a role in whether you're going to recover and recycle some of this stuff. I haven't studied the issue specifically with um, lithium iron phosphate batteries. Is that going to increase demand for phosphate? I would imagine that it will obviously increase it. Is it significant? I don't know relative to the market of phosphate rock. You know, it's about 220 million tons produced annually. It's quite a large market in comparison to some of these minor metals that we're talking about. Uh, is it going to make a big dent? It's not clear. Uh, LFP is really just now used in China, mainly for buses uh, because of the safety concern. Uh, but also now, as, as was mentioned, uh, you know, more in, in, in passenger vehicles, but still in China, um, where it is a lower performing battery. Um, so it's, it's not clear to me. It's something that perhaps should be studied, but um, I, I don't have additional information on that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nadal. Maybe I can I can go to the next question for Karen if you have any other comments on phosphorus, but the next question is really for you and it's, it's are there new opportunities in critical minerals, rare earths production uh, in places like Greenland? Yes, I was very, very happy to see that question. I've, uh, the last picture I showed was actually a picture from Greenland not from a rare earth deposit, but from a palladium uh, deposit. And But I've worked on some of the rare earth deposits in Greenland in my past. And, um, and it's a great question because it sparks a couple of interesting things that we can bring into this discussion because a really important thing, to, of course, to understand about rare earth elements is that they're not actually rare. And so the abundance of rare earth uh, mineralization is, is enormous and, and far, far, far... Um, greater than our need for the next many centuries, to be honest. So it is actually a good, it's a good example of criticality because it has not, nothing to do with geological availability at all. It is a very, very thin market. It's about as abundant geologically as copper, but we're using you know, orders of magnitude less than we're using copper. So it's a very small, thin market. That is one of the things that makes it critical. And then really importantly, the value chain again. It is not so much digging it out of the ground that's the problem here. It is actually processing the minerals into the metals that we need for our technologies. It is incredibly complex uh, relative to a lot of other uh, 
more sort of say pedestrian um, commodities. So it's, a, it's very complicated. And it actually turns out that almost all of the downstream, so taking the rock and converting it into something that we can put into our things, almost all of that happens in China. And that's why it is so important that we focus well, of course, we need to have expertise in certain parts of the value chain, but we really have to zoom out sometimes and make sure that we integrate the knowledge of the entire value chain, because the problem with, with uh, rare earths is, is much more related to the downstream processing than to the actual mining. And while Greenland could turn into a, a rare earth mining uh, nation, they probably would not have the capacity, just sheer sort of lack of population, and uh, an infrastructure to be able to do any of the downstream processing. So the current projects in Greenland actually have as part of their plan to ship almost all of it to China for, for downstream processing. So, so, th so that's, that's one reality. Another thing I, I want to just pick up, up very, very briefly that also connects to this is, is when Eris was talking about uh, how long times it take to open a mine. For most mines, actually, it, it's, it's even longer than, than Eris was, was suggesting. For many mines, it takes decades from you have a discovery until you can actually develop it, you know, maybe 15, 20 years at the best. And rare earths there are particularly slow in the upstart because of this very complex metallurgy that is unique from each different occurrence. You have to basically reinvent the whole sort of downstream uh, processing. So. That is, um, those were important facts about rare earths. Great, great answer, Karen, very nice. So ne next question, uh, perhaps uh, can pass this to Eris to, to give us some comments on. Um, one of the challenges facing producers and, and on the supply side is, oh. is how to project prices for these different metals and minerals in the future and the challenge being you know uh, if, if the demand isn't isn't firmly established and and there's any security of whether whether technology is going to go one way or another um how does that affect uh, producers ability to plan forward and justify what may be very large uh, lumpy capital investments to bring bring more supply to market um True, there is indeed what we call the uh, the incentive price projection of uh, of uh, of taking new pro of adding supply, um, but um, we we are at the point today where um, I think it's, it's it's consensus is that you can uh, you can already rely even on the um, even on the um, uh, of the lower end of the uh, you know of the um, uh, of the of the curve in terms of uh, of projected adoption rates uh, rates to uh, to justify adding uh, quite a lot more supply and capacity. The risk that uh, you know that um, that someone will uh, will end up uh, building a nickel mine that produces ultimately uh, 20, 30, or 50,000 tons of uh, of um, of nickel uh, per annum. And um, and end up without um, without a response from the demand side at the moment seems uh, seems rather low. It looks like um, you know it's, we may not see the prices we saw in 2007 of uh, 50 something thousand tons of uh, you know uh, 50 thousand uh, dollars per ton of nickel uh, uh, you know uh, perhaps even ever again and um, you know. Uh, some of the uh, you know of the spikes that we saw with with cobalt historically with copper and so on, but I think um, there are really really good and strong signals from the demand side that um, a lot of people are crossing the point of no return in terms of their commitment to investing in the downside and transitioning to a level where they will need these materials. Current supply is not enough. Current recycling is not enough. There's a there's need for a lot of supply, and we're still far from a point where all kinds of marginal projects need to decide if they're hopping on or not, and they might end up you know, missing the bus or being the guys that are in the, uh, in the highest cost quartile of the, uh, of the cost curve. There's a lot of work to be done still in the first, second uh, uh, cost curve quartiles uh, to bring on board and online uh, good projects that will, um, that will have customers. Um, they, um, they will, um, 
they will be economical, they will make money for the shareholders and for the other stakeholders. And um, um, really the message Great. at the moment is that, that we have to move forward. Um, Procarcinate right. is only gonna cause damage. Yeah, great, great, great response. Um, the next question is really for, for Karen, and, and maybe it's a very specific question, but maybe you can broaden it to, uh, to, to the general issue of the circular economy. But the question was asked about these wind turbine blades, blades which has been in, in the press lately a lot about the, the inability to recycle them and where they're being disposed of. And of course, wind power is, is uh, probably not going to be as much as solar in the US, but it's certainly going to be a massive portion of the, of the renewable energy component. Yeah, I think it's again an excellent question because it really sort of puts the finger on one of the one of the problems with with this. I want to call it actually greenwashing when we just sort of put on a green circle and say, you know, we can recycle it and then everything is good because the whole sort of recycling thing is extremely complex. For another good example to broaden it a little bit is that um, a lot of companies have looked at light weighting of cars and 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 other. Uh, um, um, airplanes, trains, these kinds of things, because if you make transportation lighter, you save energy. So this is really green, right? We all like it. That's a great idea. But it actually turns out that most of the light weighting you can do to a vehicle will make it harder to recycle. The best thing would actually be to build, to be to build the whole thing out of, of steel. Be really good at recycling steel, but then it's extremely heavy and has it gets really, really poor mileage. And it's a little bit the same with the, with the wind turbines. It's like, you know, it's it's unfortunately the complexity is such that once you do something that is green in one aspect it many times has some some other aspects to it that we need to solve and it's also a little bit back to this thing of you know if if, if, for instance, we all think we should recycle these, right? We should get all of the metals out of them. But what if it takes more energy to recycle gold out of this one than out of, out of my rock? Which is the right one to do? And, and also, if we do, for, for instance, extract gold out of this one, we leave behind the other 55 metals that are in there because they're in such small quantities that it would be basically impossible to take it out. So... This thing of, of lack of recyclability is a real challenge. And I think that, that uh, what will most likely have to happen, and I think companies are already really struggling to do, is actually to try to start getting better at designing for recyclability, knowing that sometimes that will affect how well suited a material actually is for what it's doing. Again, back to sort of electronics, you know, alloys are just optimized for that performance that we need to have. Maybe it's time that we sort of say, well, you know, we are willing to uh, be a little bit flexible on the performance side if on the other hand, we can actually recycle it. So I think that we'll see a lot of work going into um, development of new blades, new types of blades for wind turbines because that is going to have to be solved. Great. Yeah, really good. And, and we, we've got a lot of questions coming in. There is no way we're going to get to all of these uh, uh, in the time available, but, but I'm going to move, I'm going to move right along to a question for Nadal. And, uh, and thank you everybody for your questions. These are great questions coming in. Um, the question you, you discussed executive orders and some of these things that have been uh, made in the US recently. And, and the question is, you know, well, that's fine, but, but what's being done with those? How, how is this helping to shape the response uh, within the industry and, and, in, and in the country in general? Sure, great question. So uh, there is a federal strategy out there. It was um, developed by the Subcommittee on Critical Minerals and um, uh, released by Department of Commerce. It has six calls to action uh, that range from everything from you know, doing research and development to, uh, you know, having better mapping uh, of the United States to understand where these resources might be to, um, you know, having a, a, a more um, aligned workforce, um, you know, with, with actions for both uh, NSF, National Science Foundation, as well as the Department of Education. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a wide ranging uh, federal strategy and, you know, it's, it's just being implemented. And I think just as the trend for, uh, that we've seen where mineral commodity production has shifted overseas, 
has taken decades, you know, we're not going to be able to solve this problem within a year or two, right? It's going to take us a concerted effort over many, many years to be able to really turn things around. So I think, you know, I think the criticism is there is like, well, what have you really done? But I think, you know, it's, it, you know, we're moving in the right direction. Is it fast enough? Could it be faster? Possibly. Uh, but these things do take quite a, a lot of effort and a lot of time. Yeah, great, great comment. Uh, I think we've got a question from a committee member, Jim. Uh, did you have a question? Um, I do. Um, what I, you know, there's fascinating conversation and presentations today. Um, oh, wait a second, let me, I think, okay, there I am on. Um, so what, what I was wondering and would love to get some feedback from, uh, from the panelists on, when you look at other energy markets, oil, natural gas, coal, we have a phenomenal uh, robust system of tracking supply, demand, and future outlooks with the International Energy Agency that does it for, for the OECD and the world, and, I, and the Energy, Energy Information Administration, which is the US agency that does the US and, and the world at great detail. And so it just strikes me that, that, that are we moving to an area where we really ought to have, have either within existing or create new statistical agencies in the US and the world that need, that could be dedicated to, uh, to track the supply demand and outlooks for, for, for these minerals uh, because, and, and it's, it's nothing against, I think there's still a huge role for, for consultancies and, and others that track these things. Uh, but, but the difference with things like the EIA is the ability uh, within the government context to do surveys of, of all the, the supply and demand entities out there and then, and then combine all that data. So, so just are we at a point where we really ought to look at this in a much uh, uh, larger fashion? And that might go to the question on, on communicating the, the, the important aspects of this, this more broadly. I can make me jump in first. Yeah, go so, ahead. I mean, that's a central mission of our of our center at, at the, the National Minerals Information Center at USGS. Uh, we've been doing it for over a hundred years. It's part of the Organic Act, and 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 really the forward looking piece is is now in 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 legislation with the Energy Act of 2020. Um, so we do track it. We track 90 plus mineral commodities over you know 100 countries. Um, it is difficult though, because a lot of these commodities are very small markets, right? Um, and a lot of them are opaque markets uh, where the information is not readily available. It's not necessarily shared. It's a lot of times there's no market prices. They're not traded on like the LME. Um, and so there's very little information about what is going on with these commodities. And a lot of the problem that we have is that while we do send out tens of thousands of surveys, um, it's all on a voluntary basis. Um, so companies, uh, domestic and international, uh, choose or choose not to respond to our surveys to collect this information. So that's, you know, that's part of the problem. I think the bigger part is, is that there's just small niche markets that a lot of the industry players are, you know, it's part of their competitive advantage and sharing that information is just not something that they're willing to do. And uh, yeah. May I? On, I yeah, go Karen? ahead. Go, go um, ahead, Karen. To follow up a few. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to come in as well. So actually, um, this thing about the mineral statistic, BGS also does this, and we do it with a slightly different methodology. And you'll all be happy to know that we actually sort of arrive at uh, compatible answers, I'd say, or aligned answers with USGS, and also, of course, communicate about it, uh, because it's always reassuring when two slightly different methodologies arrive at, uh, at similar answers. But I also think I've actually, it was an interesting question today, because Earlier today and for the rest of the week, I am participating in the, in the United Nations Economic uh, Commission for Europe, which includes North and South America, by the way, uh, Resource Management Week 2021. And it is actually an attempt to, um, to coordinate how we deal with resource management on a global uh, level. And one of the things that this program sets out to this expert group sets out to do is to introduce a UN framework classification program for 
mineral resources. And this has actually worked for energy resources where we measure them the same way and we talk about them the same way on a global scale. And there is now this huge initiative um, coordinated by the UN to try to come up with a framework classification that works for minerals. It is much more sort of, um, you know, they're much more heterogeneous. Oil and gas, there's, Mm, a, mm, there's a limit to how variable that actually is going to be for you, but minerals are extremely variable and they're very many different kinds. So it's a little bit more complex, but it is actually working in, in progress and it's work that's leaning on some of that uh, information and knowledge that's being collected by, for example, USGS and also BGS. Jim, you want to go ahead? I was just, yeah, I fully acknowledge the complexity. I'm, and, and Nadal, what I'm, what just like, you know, what I'm thinking is that um, is actually to help raise your profile in what you're doing so that you have a little bit. I think the EIA, when they do surveys, they have some teeth on that, on the expectation of people replying to them and, and also on the, the, Keeping keeping the data, the ability to keep all that data confidential and, and aggregated. So and and recognizing that within markets it's tough. There isn't sometimes enough to aggregate for that. So I get all that. I would also be interesting in Erez's uh, thoughts on that because he comes from it from a come kind of that that you know consulting kind of tracking information uh, point of view. Yeah. We, um, as a as a global commodity house, we can, uh, yeah, we can. We also have obviously our uh, our information sources and our ability to uh, partially, of course, uh, track some of these uh, materials and trends and uh, kind of uh, have our own projections on um, on on supply and demand at least um, at least um, you know in the very short term and the very long term. And uh, one thing that uh, you know is, is pretty apparent is. I think Nadal was saying with some of these uh, products, these are not really commodities. And um, some of them that are commoditized and, and even traded in, uh, you know, in a, in a market, uh, in a terminal market, as we call it, like the LME, are not very liquid because they're just too small and too concentrated. Um, so this adds to the uh, complexity of, uh, you know, of accumulating data and statistics. And you know, there's a whole debate about what exactly is battery grade in pretty much all of these materials from, from the field, from the people that actually need to take something and convert it into whatever is the next, uh, the next link in a chain to a level where um, last year there, were, there was even some discussion in the, in the lithium space and one or two of the other materials, the guys that uh, were buying it uh, to, to make cathodes and, um, uh, and, and anodes were saying to the intermediates, those sitting between, the, uh, between them and the mines, um, you know what, don't give me battery grade because it's not really battery grade. I still need to clean it, even if it theoretically meets the spec or uh, do some work on the sizing and so on. Hold short a little bit before that. Give me clean enough industrial grade or technical grade as long as that there are no, uh, you know, hazardous impurities and everything is sort of under control, we will actually do the final refining before and, and tweaking before we introduce it into our uh, electrodes. And um, part of it might be a bit of an IP issue because then they can, you know, they can keep it more as a secret sauce. Part of it had to do, I think, with pricing and, and with the fact that many times you ended up with material that was rejected because it wasn't meeting the spec. They started arguing about who has to pay the cost of doing the final, the final cleanup, and so on. So I guess this also reflects on the fact that it's in, you know, it's an industry still, if not it's in its real infancy, uh, still it's, you know, it's a toddler stage, and um, you know, and there's a lot will be learned along the way as it uh, as it improves and expands, and uh, and the um, you know the back and forth between between the markets and the various links in the supply chain. Will, will ultimately um, lead to some kind of a, a, a direction. And, uh, you know, just scrolling back for, for a brief second to the, to the first question, from a materials perspective, no material wants to cost so much that everyone would make a huge effort to engineer it out of the supply chain. So from that perspective, 
you know, you you might think that uh, you know people would who who control cobalt would want it to be at one hundred fifty thousand dollars a ton, but that's not exactly the case because uh, then the efforts to uh, to make uh, batteries without cobalt or with less cobalt will increase. And we saw that the nickel uh, just before the global financial crisis, when nickel was in reach fifty thousand, um, the stainless steel guys invented the four hundred series without nickel. Um, so you don't want to be there. You want to make enough yeah. money, but not too much money. And everyone should, uh, you know, uh, should fairly share the pie somehow. And everyone grows together. Otherwise, it's just not sustainable. And uh, all stakers, all stakeholders need to enjoy. And it's sort of a global Kaizen, I guess, where everyone does right. plays his role gradually over the next few decades. And hopefully we'll get there or our children will get there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great. That's a great wrap up, uh, Erez. Um, really appreciate that. Good concluding remarks. Maybe uh, just give Karen and Nadal maybe 30 seconds each for some uh, concluding remarks and then we're at our, our time limit. Karen, would you like yes. to? Yes, I, you, that took me by surprise. I didn't expect that. So now I get to talk again. 30 so, seconds. Yes, 30 seconds. I, I just want to say again, that the, I think the really important thing is, is, again, to understand the complexity and not have it be a value game. It's almost a little bit as if there are people that are against mining and, and, and the ones that are for mining are sort of bad people who want to hurt the environment. We need to make the discussion much, much more complex than that. We need to take the discussion to a very, very broad audience, the general public, the decision makers, and that is probably best done through really a lot of education and a lot of, of sort of targeted conversations about the complexity and acknowledging that again, yes, we want a wind turbine, we're gonna have a problem with the blade. Yes, if we want to do this green thing, we're gonna get a problem with that. And, and let's, instead of sort of pointing fingers and being good and bad, let's talk about solutions. Great. I'll, you know, I completely agree with Karen. This is a, a absolutely correct point. Um, I think maybe stepping back a little bit, this is one of the biggest transitions that's going to happen um, with this energy transition, as, as you mentioned, John, both from the, the, the supply side for electricity, but also on the demand side, the use side. And, and non-fuel mineral commodities are going to play a key role in that. And I think the big question is, you know, how are we going to be able to meet that demand? Um, and is, is the U.S. and other developed countries um, going to have a significant role or are they going to be more of the users of, of the supply chains that are going to probably last for many, many decades and really transform, uh, transform the world? Um, and so there, there are, I think, targeted things that can be done to alleviate some of these risks that can um, and help fulfill some of that demand. And I think it, 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 there's no single silver bullet. You'll have to look at recycling. You'll have to look at new developments, you'll have to look at alternative materials. Uh, but I think the key question is, um, you know, which are these uh, strategies or tactics is gonna be most effective for which commodity? And that I think uh, needs to be understood better. Great. Well, that's excellent. I, I'd like to say thank you to our three speakers, um, Erez Nadal and Karen, uh, you, you did an excellent job and uh, it was great discussion. We could have done with another hour at least. And uh, there are a lot of questions I'm sorry we did not get to. There are a few of those that I think are gonna be addressed in the next two webinars, uh, several in particular that I see related to public perceptions and those sorts of things and regulatory environmental climate. So uh, thank you to the NASEM staff and, uh, and the rest of the committee. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing everybody hopefully on, on May 17th for the second webinar. <coughs> hopefully all of you couldn't make it. And uh, thank you all for your participation. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.